Caldwell, chapter 5, page 68. <clears throat> With the dogs falling, Mercedes weeping and writing, Hal swearing innocuously, and Charles' eyes wistfully watering, they staggered into John Thornton's camp at the mouth of White River. When they halted, the dogs dropped down as though they had all been struck dead. Mercedes dried her eyes and looked at John Thornton. Charles sat down on a log to rest. He sat down very slowly and painstakingly, aware of his great stiffness. Hal did the talking. John Thornton was whittling the last touches of an axe handle he had made from a stick of birch. He whittled and listened, gave monosyllabic replies, and, when it was asked, terse advice. He knew the breed, and he gave his advice in the certainty that it would not be followed. <clears throat> monosyllabic. Yeah, no, mono, one, syllable. They told us up above that the bottom was dropping out of the trail and that the best thing for us to do was to lay over, Hal said in response to Thornton's warning to take no more chances on the rotten ice. They told us we couldn't make White River, and here we are, the last with a sneering ring of triumph in it. And they told you true? John Thornton answered, the bottom's likely to drop out at any moment. Only fools with the blind luck of fools could have made it. I tell you straight, I wouldn't risk my carcass on that ice for all the gold in Alaska. That's because you're not a fool, I suppose, said Hal. All the time we'll go on to Dawson, he uncoiled his whip. Get up there, Buck. Hi, right. get up there, mush on, Thornton went on whittling. It was idle, he knew, to go get between fool and his folly, while two of three fools, more or less, would not alter the scheme of things. But the team did not get up at the command. It had long since passed into the stage where blows were required to rouse it. The whip flashed out here and there on the merciless errands. John Thornton compressed his lips. Solex was the first to crawl to his feet. Teak followed. Joe came next, yelping with pain. Pike made painful efforts. Twice he fell over when half up, and on the third attempt managed to rise. Buck made no effort. He lay quietly where he had fallen. The lash bit into him again and again, but he neither whined nor struggled. Several times Thornton started as though to speak, but changed his mind. A moisture came into his eyes, and as the whipping continued, he arose and walked irresu irresu irresolutely up and down. This was the first time Buck had failed in it itself a sufficient reason to drive Hal into a rage. He exchanged the whip for the customary club. Buck refused to move under the rain of heavy, heavier blows, which now fell upon him. Like his mates, he was barely able to get up, but unlike them, he had made up his mind not to get up. He had a vague feeling of impending doom. This had been strong upon him when he pulled it into the bank, and it had not departed from him. What with the thin and rotten ice he had felt under his feet all day, it seemed that he sensed disaster close at hand, out there ahead on the ice, where his master was trying to drive him. He refused to stir. So greatly had he suffered, and so far gone was he, that the blows did not hurt much. And as they continued to fall upon him, the spark of life within flickered and went down. It was nearly out. He felt strangely numb, as though from a great distance he was aware that he was being beaten. The last sensations of pain left him. He no longer felt anything, though very faintly he could hear the impact of the club upon his body. But it was no longer his body. It seemed so far away. And then suddenly, without warning, uttering a cry that was inarticulate and more like a cry of an animal, John Thornton sprang upon the man who wielded the club. Howe was hurled backward as though struck by a falling tree. Mercedes screamed. Charles looked on wistfully, wiped his watery eyes, but did not get up because of his stiffness. John Thornton stood over Buck, struggling to control himself, too convulsed with rage to speak. If you strike that dog again, I'll kill you, he at last managed to say in a choking voice. It's my dog, Hal replied, wiping the blood from his mouth And as he came back. Get out of my way or I'll fix you. I'm going to Dawson. Thornton stood between him and Buck and evinced no intention of getting out of the way. Hal drew his long hunting knife. Mercedes screamed, cried, laughed, and manifested the chaotic abandonment of hysteria. Thornton wrapped Hal's knuckles with the axe handle, knocking the knife to the ground. He wrapped his knuckles again as he tried to pick it up. 
Then he stooped, picked it up himself, and with two strokes cut Buck's traces. Hal had no fight left in him. Besides, his hands were full with his sister, or his arms, rather, while Buck was too near dead to be of further use in hauling the sled. A few minutes later, they pulled out from the bank and down the river. Buck heard them go and raised his head to see. Pike was leading. Solex was at the wheel. In between were Joe and Teak. They were limping and staggering. Mercedes was rising, riding the loaded sled. <coughs> Hal guided at the gee pole, and Charles stumbled along in the rear. As Buck watched them, Thornton knelt down beside him and with rough, kindly hands searched for broken bones. By the time his search had disclosed nothing more than many bruises and a state of terrible starvation, the sled was a quarter mile away. Dog and man watched it crawling along over the ice. Suddenly, they saw its back end drop down as into a rut. <clears throat> and the gee pole, with Hal clinging to it, jerked into the air. Mercedes screamed, came to their ears. They saw Charles turn and make one step to run back, and then a whole section of ice gave way, and dogs and humans disappear. A yawning hole was all that was to be seen. The bottom had dropped out of the trail. John Thornton and Buck looked at each other. You poor devil, said John Thornton, and Buck licked his hand. <clears throat> Chapter 6, For the Love of a Man. When John Thornton froze his feet in the previous December, his partners had made him comfortable and left him to get well, going on themselves up the river to get out, of a, get out a raft of saw logs for Dawson. He was still limping slightly at the time he rescued Buck, but with the continued warm weather, even the slight limp left him. And here, lying on by the riverbank, through the long spring days, watching the running water, listening lazily to the songs of birds and the hum of nature, Buck slowly won back his strength. A rest comes very good after one has traveled 3,000 miles, and it must be confessed that Buck waxed lazy as his wounds healed, his muscles swelled out, and the flesh came back to cover his bones. For that matter, they were all loafing, Buck, John Thornton, and Skeet, and Nig, waiting for the raft to come that was to carry them down to Dawson. Skeet was a little Irish setter who early made friends with Buck, who, in a dying condition, was unable to resent her first advances. She had the doctor trait, which some dogs possess. Here we go. And as a mother cat watches, washes her kittens, so she washed and cleansed Buck's wounds. Regularly, each morning after he had finished his breakfast, she performed her self-appointed task till he came to look for her ministrations as much as he did for Thornton's. Nig, equally friendly though less demonstrative, was a huge black dog, half bloodhound and half deerhound, with eyes that laughed and a boundless good nature. To Buck's surprise, these dogs manifested no jealousy toward him. They seemed to share the kindliness and largeness of John Thornton. As Buck grew stronger, they enticed him into all sorts of ridiculous games in which Thornton himself could not forbear to join. And in this fashion, Buck romped through his convalescence, like old folks' home convalescence, and into a new existence. Love, genuine passionate love, was his for the first time. This he had never experienced at Judge Miller's down in the sun-kissed Santa Clara Valley. With the judge's sons hunting and tramping, it had been a working partnership. With the judge's grandsons, a sort of pompous guardianship. And with the judge himself, a stately and dignified friendship. But love, that was feverish and burning. That was adoration. That was madness. It had taken John Thornton to arouse. The man had saved his life, which was something. But further, he was the ideal master. Other men saw to the welfare of their dogs from a sense of duty and business expediency. He saw to the welfare of his as if they were his own children, because he could not help it. And he saw further. He never forgot a kindly greeting or a cheering word. And to sit down for a long talk with them, gas, he called it, was as much his delight as theirs. He had a way of taking Buck's head roughly between his hands and resting his own head upon Buck's, of shaking him back and forth, the while calling him ill names that to Buck were love names. Buck knew no greater joy than that rough embrace and the sound of murmured oaths, and at each jerk back and forth it seemed that his heart would be shaken out of his body. So great was its ecstasy. And when released, he sprang to his feet. 
his mouth laughing, his eyes eloquent, his throat vibrant with unuttered sound. And in that fashion remained without movement, John Thornton would reverently exclaim, God, you can all but speak. Buck had a trick of love expression that was akin to hurt. He would often seize Thornton's hands in his mouth and close so fearfully that the, that the flesh bore the impress of his teeth for some time afterwards. And as Buck understood the oaths to be love words, so the man understood his feigned bite for a caress. For the most part, however, Buck's love was expressed in ad adoration. While he went wild with happiness when Thornton touched him or spoke to him, he did not seek these tokens. Unlike Skeet, who was wont to shove her nose under Thornton's hand and nudge and nudge till petted, or Nig, who would stalk up and rest his great head on Thornton's knee, Buck was con content to adore at a distance. He would lie by the hour, eager, alert at Thornton's feet, looking up into his face, dwelling upon it, studying it, following with keenest interest each fleeting expression, every movement or change of feature, or as chance might have it, he would lie farther away to the side or rear, watching the outlines of the man and the occasional movements of his body. And often, such was the communion in which they lived, the strength of Buck's gaze would draw John Thornton's head around, and he would return the gaze without speech, his heart shining out of his eyes, at Buck's heart shone out. Man, what a cool description of dogs. I mean, I just can't, I'm just, I just have all these memories of dog, my dogs throughout my life um, and how they're so similar in some ways and different in other ways, but and they're all different in their own ways. It's really neat. For a long time after his rescue, Buck did not like Thornton to get out of his sight. From the moment he left the tent to, which, to when he entered it again, Buck would follow at his heels. His transient masters, since he had come into the Northland, had bred in him a fear that no master could be permanent. He was afraid that Thornton would pass out of his life as Peralt and Francois and the, and the Scotch half-breed had passed out. That's the one I forgot yesterday. Even in the night, <clears throat> in his dreams, he was haunted by this fear. At such times, he would shake off sleep and creep through the chill to the flap of the tent where he would stand and listen to the sound of his master's breathing. But in spite of this great love he bore John Thornton, which seemed to bespeak the soft, civilizing influence, the strain of the primitive, which the Northland had aroused in him, remained alive and active. Faithfulness and devotion, things born of fire and roof, were his. Yet he retained his wildness and wiliness. <clears throat> he was a thing of the wild, come in from the wild to sit by John Thornton's fire, rather than a dog of the soft Southland stamped with the marks of generations of civilization. Because of his very great love, he could not steal from this man, but from any other man, in any other camp, he did not hesitate an instant, while the cunning with which he stole enabled him to escape detection. His face and body were scored by the teeth of many dogs, and he fought as fiercely as ever and more shrewdly. Skeet and Nig were too good-natured for quarreling. Besides, they belonged to John Thornton. But the strange dog, no matter what the breed or valor, <clears throat> swiftly acknowledged Buck's supremacy or found himself struggling for life with a terrible antagonist. And Buck was merciless. He had learned well the law of club and fang, and he never forewent an advantage or drew back from a foe he had started on the way to death. He had lessened from spits and from the chief fighting dogs of the police and mail. He knew there was no middle course. He must master or be mastered. While to show mercy was a weakness, mercy did not exist in the primordial life. It was misunderstood for fear, and such misunderstandings made for death. Kill or be killed. Eat or be eaten was the law, and this mandate down out of the depths of time he obeyed. Remember the whole uh, Darwin thing? Yeah. He was older than the days he had seen and the breaths he had drawn. He linked the past with the present, and the eternity behind him throbbed through him in a mighty rhythm to which he swayed as the tides and seasons swayed. He sat by John Thornton's fire, a broad-breasted dog, white-fanged and long-furred, but behind him were the shades of all manner of dogs, half wolves and wild wolves, urgent and prompting, tasting the savor of the meat he, he ate, thirsting for the water he drank, scenting the wind with him, listening with him and telling him the sounds made by the wildlife in the forest, de 
dictating his moods, directing his actions, lying down to sleep with him when he lay down, and dreaming with him and beyond him and becoming themselves the stuff of his dreams. So peremptorily did these shake, shades beckon him that each day mankind and the claims of mankind slipped farther from him. Deep in the forest, a call was sounding, and as often as he heard this call, mysteriously thrilling and luring, he felt compelled to turn his back upon the fire and the beaten earth around it and to plunge into the forest and on and on. He knew not where or why, nor did he wonder where or why, the call sounding imperiously deep in the forest, but as often as he gained the soft, unspoken, unbroken earth and the green shade, the love for John Thornton drew him back to the fire again. Thornton alone held him, the rest of mankind, was as nothing. Chance travelers might praise or pet him, but he was cold under it all. And from a too demonstrative man, he would get up and walk away. When Thornton's partners, Hans and Pete, arrived on the long expected raft, Buck refused to notice them till he learned they were close to Thompson. After that, he tolerated them in a passive sort of way, accepting favors from them as though he favored them by accepting. They were of the same large type as Thornton, living close to the earth, thinking simply and seeing clearly. And ere they swung the raft into the big eddy by the sawmill at Dawson, they understood Buck and his ways, and did not insist upon an intimacy such as obtained with Skeet and Nig. Mm. Let's do one more. For Thornton, however, his love seemed to grow and grow. He alone among men could put a pack upon buck's back in the summer traveling nothing was too great for buck to do when thornton commanded one day they had grub stacked themselves from the proceeds of the raft and left dawson for the headwaters of the tanana the men and dogs were sitting on the crest of a cliff which fell away straight down to naked bedrock 300 feet below John Thornton was sitting near the edge, buck at his shoulder. A thoughtless whim seized Thornton, and he drew the attention of Hans and Pete to the experiment he had in mind. Jump, buck, he commanded, sweeping his arm out and over the chasm. The next instant, he was grappling with buck on the extreme edge, while Hans and Pete were dragging them back into safety. Dang, I'm glad that didn't work. It's uncanny, Pete said, after it was over and they had caught their speech. Thornton shook his head. No, it's splendid. And it's terrible, too. Do you know, it sometimes makes me afraid. I'm not hankering to be the man that lays hands on you while he's around, Pete announced conclusively, nodding his head toward Buck. Pa Jingo was Hans' contribution. Not myself either, 